this morning, just for a couple of minutes, we're going to be returning back to the book of Romans, which is what we've been doing as a series. And we're up to chapter 3 in the book of Romans. So what I wanted to do, just play a, a, a short video, um, giving everyone just a, a quick rundown again, where right, what Romans is, where it's at, and what's happening. Paul's letter to the Romans is one of the longest and most significant things that this man ever wrote. As you may remember, Paul, he was formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. He was a Jewish rabbi. He belonged to this group known as the Pharisees. And he was super passionate and devout to the Jewish Torah of Moses and to the Jewish practices and traditions of his people. And from his point of view, Jesus and his whole movement and followers were a threat to the stability and security and safety of God's people. And so he later had a radical encounter with the risen Jesus himself, and he became one of his followers, surprisingly. Now, he started going by his Roman name, Paul, and he was even commissioned as an apostle, which is like an official representative of Jesus. So Paul, he went about as a missionary, telling people about Jesus all over the ancient Roman world. And people would become followers of Jesus and form into these Jesus communities, or churches, as he called them. And as time went on, he would write letters to these churches to help foster their faith or address problems that were coming up or to answer their questions and so on. The letter to the Romans is one of these. We also know from the book of Acts, you should check out Acts chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, we know that the church in Rome consisted of both Jewish Christians, followers of Jesus, but also non-Jewish or Gentile Christians. And a number of years before Paul wrote this letter, the Roman emperor, a guy named Claudius, he had all the Jewish people expelled and run out of Rome for about five years until he died. And so five years later, then all those Jews, including Christian Jews, were allowed to come back to Rome and return. But when they did, they came back to their church community and realized it had become very non-Jewish in their customs and practices, the way they talk. And so you can imagine there's all these tensions that arise. So should non-Jewish followers of Jesus celebrate the Sabbath? Should they eat according to the Jewish kosher dietary laws? Should they be circumcised? And so on. So he says right at the beginning and at the end of the letter, he wants this church to become unified as one whole family of people in Jesus. And for a clear reason, he wants this church to become a staging ground so that they can send him as a missionary to go even further west, past Rome, all the way to Spain. And the letter, it's long, and it has one long connected flow of thought, but it's broken up into four really clear kind of movements of thought. So in the first main movement, chapters one through four, Paul makes some foundational points that he's gonna develop throughout the whole rest of the letter. In chapter 1, he starts telling a story about the non-Jewish world, the Gentiles, and he says that all humanity has become trapped in this spiral of sin and selfishness. He argues that the human heart and mind has turned inward on itself because of idolatry, which is giving ultimate allegiance and devotion to created things that are not the one true God. And it results, Paul says, in this distortion of our humanity. And so he concludes that all nations are in need of God's grace and God's mercy. It's chapter 1. In chapter 2, he says the Jewish people might respond and say, well, good thing for us, you know, we've been shown God's grace and mercy. He rescued us out of Egypt. He showed us how to become true humans by giving us the Torah at Mount Sinai. He gave us these practices about Sabbath and eating kosher and circumcision. But Paul stops and he says, no, not so fast. He says the people of Israel, if you read the story of the scriptures, they've proven themselves to be just as bad and corrupt as the rest of the human race through hypocrisy and rebellion. And so even the Jewish people themselves, his own people, are just as broken and sinful as the rest of humanity. And so he draws his conclusion in chapter 3. He says that all humanity, it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, all humanity is trapped in the brokenness of sin and rebellion and selfishness. And so the resolution to this huge human mess, it comes to its high point right here at the end of chapter 3 in this crucial paragraph, and it's, it's very dense. Paul unpacks the significance of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, and the good news. He says that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah whose death on the cross was a sacrifice, 
where he took into himself all of the pain and the sin and the results of all humanity's evil. So that through him, all sin could be put to death, paid for, dealt with once and for all. And it's by trusting in Jesus' death and resurrection that was for us, that that's how we find life and forgiveness and we come into right relationship with God. It's what Paul calls God justifying sinners. And so he rounds off this first movement of thought by saying that God's purposes for all humanity have been fulfilled through Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. However, God's purpose was not that everyone has to become Jewish or obey the Torah and follow Jewish practices. Rather, God's goal, Paul says, was to create a huge family, a big multi-ethnic family of all kinds of different people who are saved by the Jewish Messiah and brought into a family that's in right relationship with God. Now, this was actually a really scandalous idea. You have a crucified Messiah remaking the family of God's people, including people from all nations. This is not a popular idea for other Jewish people in Paul's day. And so Paul, he makes super clear at the end of chapter 3, he says, listen, I'm not contradicting the scriptures of the Torah, but actually this new family around Jesus is what the story of the Torah is all about. And that Yeah, I was just going to say amen and sit down and think, well, the sermon's done and all is good. But we will unpack it a little bit more than that. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have all become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. That's a fairly heavy passage to hear or to read. And that's actually the passage that Paul quotes in Romans 3. At the start of Romans 3, it comes from Psalm Chapter 14. It's heavy going. But it leads, everything leads to Romans 3, chapter, uh, verses 21 to 26, which is seen as the key text actually for the book of Romans. Everything hinges upon those couple of verses. So let's look at this. So I'll read from the NIV version, Romans 3, verse 21 to 26. But now apart from the law of righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And he did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed before unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. I'll read this passage again, this time from the message. But in our time, something new has been added. What Moses and the prophets witnessed all those years has happened. God setting things right that we read about has become Jesus setting things right for us. And not only for us, but for everyone who believes in him. There is no difference between us and them in this. Since we've compiled this long and sorry record as sinners, both us and them, and prove that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us. God did it for us out of sheer generosity. He put us in right standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by the means of Jesus Christ. God sacrificed. Stop. 
God sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world to clear that world of sin. Having faith in him sets us in the clear. God decided on this course of action in full view of the public to set the world in the clear with himself through the sacrifice of Jesus. Finally taking care of the sins he had so patiently endured. This is not only clear, but it's now. This is current history. God sets things right. He also makes it possible for us to live in his righteousness. So, in the first two chapters and the first half of chapter 3, Paul has been arguing that all, without exception, sin and deserve judgment. If you read through those chapters, that's what he's saying. God demands perfect obedience and we all fall short of this standard. So how then will people become right with God? In verses 21, verse 22, that Paul states that a right relation with God is not obtained by keeping the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And all people who trust in Christ are justified by God because of redemption accomplished by Christ Jesus, which is in verse 24. Heavy passages, but very, very important passages. And for me, the key words in this are sin and justification. Why are they key, you may ask? That's a great question to ask. I'm happy to say why you know, that is. And that's because everything about this sin justification is the foundation of the gospel message, as we know. All have sinned. The consequences of this is death. Jesus chose to stand in our place and accept our fate. And if we believe and call out and repent, we will have eternal life, experiencing a love beyond what we can only imagine. For me though, and it might be just me, there's probably others that see that, I'm not sure, but I don't think I'm on my own. If I look around at our churches, what they're preaching on, what they're talking about, what people are talking about on Facebook and in groups, sin is not often mentioned. There's a lot of talk about love and grace, but talk about sin and the consequences of sin. It seems silent, doesn't it? I don't know about you, but that's how it seems to me. That is unless we declare sin and call sin sin, then sometimes things get really interesting out in the world, doesn't it? Just ask a guy called Israel Folau. I don't know if you've heard about or followed what's happened with him. But someone asked him directly a scriptural question. What does God say about this? A direct scriptural question. So his answer was... Unless they repent, they will go to hell. Sin, consequence of sin. But because the question was framed around the whole gay and lesbian lifestyle and choices that people make, there was an outpouring of emotions that there was this global meltdown on social media all against him. And it involved people like the heads of Qantas and all sorts of things. They got out of hand. The thing is, if someone asked Israel Falau or myself, or you guys even, the same question around what would God talk about uncontrolled anger or lust or gossip, how does he see that? And our answer would be the same as that other answer, which is, unless you repent... The penalty is death. Sin is sin. The thing is, I think Israel only gave half the answer. And he left out the best bits. In verse 25, 
God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Leon Morris puts it in the cross in the New Testament, a book that he wrote. Justification is essentially a legal term. It means a verdict of acquittal. To justify means to declare not guilty. When Paul speaks of men as justified, then he means that they have God's verdict of acquittal. When they stand before the bar of God's justice, they need have no fear, for the judge has already given his verdict in their favour. And that's the other half of the, the answer that should have been said. Yes, sin is sin. Yes, there are consequences of sin. But, because of the cross, Jesus and what he did, we can stand before the judge knowing already that the declaration of not guilty is here, that we have freedom. You see, if we stay stuck on the fact that we are all sinners and the consequences of death, leaving off the rest of it, then we will try to do whatever we can to save us through whatever we can do. Which is what the Israelites did through the sacrificial systems. It's what people do through works. It's what people do, I have to go out and do this or do that so that I will be saved. And I'll we'll try to work their way through it. About 500 years ago, Martin Luther was struggling with a similar question. And he was studying to be a lawyer. And what do I need to do to save myself? And so like all good lawyers, he thought, I'm going to become a monk. Because that's better than being a lawyer. And so he went and became a monk. And he read and studied the Bible, not just a little bit, but a lot. And he confessed sins, even the most trivial ones. Apparently he confessed sins for hours. His entire life was about appeasing God, an angry God. On one occasion, his confessor, <coughs> Father Stalpitz, became sick of Luther's ongoing list of trivial confessions. Then he told Luther to go and do something worth confessing. On another occasion, Luther was extremely diligent with his confession as he determined to get right with God. And so after Stalpitz announced God's forgiveness on him, Luther be began to leave the confessional thinking how good he was that now there was nothing that stood between him and God. Then it dawned on him. He had just failed the humility test. And pride being one of the deadly sins meant that all that good work had to be undone. So he turned around and went back to the confessional to confess this. thing is, no matter how hard he tried, what he did, there was always that issue between himself and God. Luther's continual striving for a good relationship with God was failing him. So instead of him having peace with God, he would often be, dis, um, he'd be down, be disheartened and worried. But God used Luther's striving to reveal the central truth of Christianity, which is the second half of that answer. And when Luther read from Romans 1, 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So, you saw Luther's journey. And that journey turned him around when you, when you realised the truth, the second half of the answer. But for so many people, if the only message that they hear from the church, if the only message that they hear from us as Christians is that God is always against this, he's against that, he doesn't want you to do this, he doesn't want you to do that, then what's the view of the church? What's the view of God? And they are missing out on the best bits. It's not what God is against. It's what God is for. That's the key. That's what's important. God is for eternal life to start right now with everybody. 
God is for relationships. God is for love. That's what Luther discovered. And because of that, his whole view of Christianity changed. No longer was the emphasis is that we had to do all this stuff and live up to those godly expectations to appease an angry God. Instead, God was not only, not only offering us a life with him, he's making it possible for this life to happen through the life, death and resurrection of his son Jesus. And that all is required of us is to have faith that Jesus has done all that is needed for us to save this life. The Reformation happened not because Luther was first against something. It happened because he was standing for something. He was standing for the fact, the truth that God is a graceful God. Romans, the book of Romans, is a life-changing letter. And if you get the whole answer, it will change your life. The initial act of salvation, which is justification, is solely by grace through faith, not by anything we can do or work towards or give. Once we become believers, though, there is that lifelong walk of obedience and growth in holiness with God. Sure, this too is, in a sense, grace by faith, because we will continue to um, get it wrong. But we have a real role to play in making right choices, saying no to the flesh, crucifying self, and so on. Because of Christ and his work at Calvary, the believer is justified or declared to be righteous before God. But then in our daily experience, we need to live this out and grow in personal righteousness and holiness. And this is the message that I think is being lost in some of the churches today because we've stopped talking about sin. Let me explain. Scott McKnight wrote an article recently looking at why sin is not spoken about. And he says this, Too many, sin has fallen into grace. What does that mean? When we talk about God's grace, we're assuming the reality of sin, that we are sinners and that God has forgiven us. But in our language today, sin is not only an assumption, it is an accepted assumption. And not only is it an accepted assumption, it also doesn't seem to matter. It's as if we're saying, yes, of course we sin, and then do nothing about it. He goes on to say, one day after I spoke at a church, a college student approached me and began telling me about her roommate. And I'm sure you know someone who's like this young man. First, she told me her roommate had slept with more than one guy that semester and that her roommate got drunk most Saturday nights. That her roommate was also very active in the Bible study and that she was also in the worship band. I asked, does your roommate consider herself a Christian? The young woman responded, of course she's a Christian. I was perhaps more bothered by that last response than by the actions of the roommate. For this person talking to me, the issue wasn't Christian or not. But why would I even ask such a question? Her final words to me were, God forgives, you know. Her tone wasn't one of gratitude for God's grace, but, pres a, but presumption of God's grace. I was troubled by as much by her attitude as I am by what I see as a trend among our culture. Sin is falling into grace and disappearing from our concerns. He finishes by saying, there you have it. When you don't see the gravity of sin, you won't be reliant upon God for the grace of sanctification and transformation. And holiness won't be our aim. You don't see the gravity of sin. 
then you won't realise or grasp God's graciousness and holiness. In Romans 6, and I won't read too much because I'll take away the thunder from whoever's preaching on Romans 6, but it starts off by saying, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Grace gives us the power to overcome sin, not a license to sin. I stated when we, when we looked at chapter 1 that Paul's letter to the Roman church is a life-changing letter. We need, though, to embrace everything written within this letter and not just what works for us. Don't shy away from acknowledging sin. Sin is still sin. That will never change. But neither will God declaring us righteous because of the cross. George Eldon Ladd said this, The idea expressed by justification is to declare righteous, not to make righteous. See the difference? To declare righteous, not to make righteous. The root idea in justification is the declaration of the righteous judge that those who believe in Christ, sinful though they may be, are righteous are viewed as being righteous because in Christ they have come into a righteous relationship with God. And that, my friends, is life-changing. Let me finish with words of Dave Pawson in his book, The God and the Gospel of Righteousness. We need to be aware that unrighteousness is no problem to God. If a man will repent of his unrighteousness, God can do wonders. He will treat him as a saint from then on, and he will make him into a saint. Do you realise that the cross was a double substitution? It is a double exchange. Give him your sins and take his righteousness. It's not a fair exchange, but it's a good one. It's a good one.